AOMR sessions. We will continue with the TNA user presentations. And the next one is a presentation by Cyprus Subsea Consulting and Services, which applied to the installations of uh, NOC in, in, in UK. And it's going to be presented by Daniel uh, Hayes. So whenever you want to start. Yeah. Okay, can you see the screen? Mm, yeah, I see the desktop only. Sorry? I see the desktop image, I think. Oh. Oh. Do you, can you present it from there or otherwise I might have... Oh, there it is. Okay. How's that? Yeah, now yes. Okay. You can put so, it full screen. Yeah. Okay, so okay. thank you very much. And um, I'll try to be quick. I know we're behind. Uh, first of all, thanks a lot to the organizers of the conference and also especially to the project, uh, the EU Marine Robots and the uh, opportunity to access this uh, infrastructure was very important for us as a small company. We do a lot of work with gliders, but we don't actually own any gliders. Um, so all of our work is with this kind of arrangement, which is really, really important for us. Uh, I'm going to today talk about active and passive acoustics using underwater gliders. So you see pictures and uh, data from gliders earlier today. So you kind of I already introduced you to that. Uh, I'm Daniel Hayes, and Jason FD is the main engineer on this. And uh, I'll start with just a quick summary of who we are. We're just a small company. We're six employees, we're some subcontractors. We do a lot of work with oceanography, ocean engineering, you know, through surveys, uh, integrating the technology into different platforms, and applying that in different scenarios like maritime security or operational oceanography. We do have a small aspect of supplying equipment and services, but mostly we're doing research projects and um, uh, integrations of new technologies. Uh, so this particular one, we were able to access the sea glider at the uh, National Oceanography Center in the UK. This photo is a an old photo from a glider from the University of Cyprus, which we uh, borrowed. For your project, but it was the same idea. Um, the idea in the, the TNA was to use a scatter to both in integrate passive acoustic hydrophone and an, and an active acoustic uh, becker sounder. So starting with the passive system, um, many of you probably already know, but using that with the glider is has a lot of advantages. So gliders can be out for months at a time. They are less costly than going with other instruments many times. They can cover large areas, as we saw earlier today. They're not very intrusive into the environment. They're very, very quiet. Um, difficult to detect by mammals, for example, in the example I'll show. Uh, they, they can go to a thousand meters, and they can also measure a lot of other things at the same time. Uh, on the downside, uh, it's difficult to determine what exactly it is that is being detected. You don't have too many, up, too much bandwidth to send back raw data to the user. And the processing power is usually quite limited on the glider. Uh, it's difficult to locate the source, although we have another project to put an array on a glider, which you can see in the bottom picture. And of course, gliders are slow and the navigation is not very precise. Um, have some sort of advanced piece of tracking, which is not very common. Um, so in this TNA project, we integrated this. So because we couldn't go to Southampton because of the pandemic, they actually sent the glider to us, Cypress. We integrated the hydrophone that we already own and 
and I'll show you the photo of that in a second. Uh, and then we've sent the glider back, and right now it's actually at sea, uh, very near the coast of Ireland on this uh, shelf break system. Uh, and that's an excellent place to test the passive acoustic system because there are uh, well documented presence of marine mammals in the area. And you can go to the Mars site at NRC and you can see where it is right now. This is a screenshot from today. Uh, so obviously we don't have the data back yet, um, but I can tell you what we hope to see. Um, this device is made by Ocean Sonics, it's called the IC Listen. There's a lot of uh, processing and capabilities built into it. Um, of course, it's very sensitive and it's, it's well calibrated. Uh, one of the main reasons we chose this device was because we could use um, a circuitry called G Listen Board and integrated into the drive part of the glider, which would act as a bridge between the Ethernet interface of the device and RS232 of the glider and allow us to extract information about what was being observed and sent back to shore over the satellite connection. Uh, it can also send spectra back in real time. Um, it's very simplified analysis. In other words, we don't have an advanced detector algorithms, but the hydrophone comes, when you buy it, it comes with the capability to detect um, triggers. So you specify various ranges of frequencies and um, intensity of energy, and it will, if it is triggered, it will record that as a triggered event, and then it will save either the raw data or the spectra, and then those can be sent back, including the protection table. So you have some information about what's going on before you get the unit back, which is usually what happens. Um, the other part of the TNA, which unfortunately didn't work out, is to active uh, acoustic uh, echo sounding with a Kongsberg EK80 device. It's called the WBT Mini. Uh, this has been used in another project that we've been part of from a sail buoy, which is what's shown on the lower right. And this is an, a way to find uh, small particles in the water. Um, in this application, it's plankton. Um, it could also be bubbles or other small particles. And the idea in the TNA was to put both of these on the glider at the same time. And with this application from the marine mammals, it's, it's very good because you not only know where you've detected mammals, but where the food is. And it's all done from a single platform. It's also important that we have measured things like dissolved oxygen, chlorophyll, temperature, salinity at the same time. So this gives you a of a single platform, a lot of information about the ecosystem. Uh, um, Daniel, uh, sorry, but we can wrap up a bit because we are on a tech schedule. And yep. <laughs> okay. Yep. So this is what it looks like. Uh, one of the circuits didn't, uh, it failed during the testing, so we're able to send it off to the NOC. So that glider right now only has the hydrophone. And that's, that's how it would look. The transistor is there. And luckily we have funding to do this in another project next year. So thanks a lot. Sorry I took too long. Yeah, thanks for the presentation. Uh, sorry for pushing you, but uh, yeah, we have okay. so many presentations. <laughs> I, I didn't know how much time was passing. <laughs> Ah, okay, so I remember the next presenter is five minutes. Uh, so the next one is from University of Toulon that actually they were just three weeks ago in our installations and Claire Dune is going to present it. So Claire, you wanna go ahead? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So I will share my screen. Mm, I'm sorry, I will also close the door, I think. Can you see the slides? 
Yes. Okay. Um, so uh, we were in Girona in a, a few weeks ago uh, to make some experiment with uh, a mocap ground truth um, in their in their pool in the pool of of the CRS. And so we did many experiments uh, that uh, were all the, the, the common things in all these experiments were the use of uh, the mo motion capture as ground truth. So um, uh, you can see in this picture the pool of the CIRS, and we installed in it uh, several uh, Calisi system motion capture. And we added some markers on the robot of Girona, and we tried our algorithm with uh, this system uh, to monitor everything. So, so the first project we are working on in our lab is a project about um, checking the quality of the dynamic feature in the simulator and trying to, to build or to conceive a simulator that is uh, able to determine the dynamic parameters of a system. I'm sorry, I will need to find my battery. Uh, so I will need a second. Uh, Um, so I went, maybe need a second because I have no more battery left. So you can see on the on the left screen the simulator, the SPH simulator, and on the bottom left, so you can see another rendering of this simulator. So we have experiencing um, dynamical parameter estimation using this kind of simulator, and we have compared it with uh, ground truth data using the Sparus robot. So in a first experiment, we went without the motion capture system. And this time we use the sensor embedding in the robot uh, with also the motion capture to try to identify all the parameters of the system and to see if we can find the same parameter as our simulator. Uh, so the second e experiment uh, is uh, on a project that is about uh, trying to make a chain of robots in order to control a tesser in, uh, uh, in closed environments. And so um, we, we designed a specific tesser and using some uh, information, some video information on the tesser, we are trying to control, to visual control all the robots in a chain of robots. So um, we have tested some uh, detection and uh, shape estimation with both the image and the motion capture system. And on the, you can see a video of a chain of robots and to acquire the shape of the, of the tesser and try to, to find out the, the proper parameterization and the proper uh, shape of this tesser. Then uh, we are also working on another project that is about uh, diver localization using ultrasound system with a company that is called Nautiloplus and that is a building a specific Okay, I think that the battery finished. I think I have the slides from them. Uh, uh, one second. Hmm. Can we stop somebody that is sharing? Yeah. Uh, so I will continue for Claire. Uh, so basically they are working with Naughty Blue Plus, which is the designer of, of this kind of robot. 
and what they are doing is similar to what they the University of Auckland presented. So they do gesture recognition on divers. You can see here an example. They put uh, some markers on the robot and on the divers so they can have a, a ground truth of the gestures that, that they are doing. We did also uh, another experiment I took over you, Claire. <laughs> they also did another experiment with the blue rob and an intelligent theater management system uh, where uh, it's giving or taking the theater as the robot needs. And finally, we gather some data set uh, taking the ground truth of the robot of an underwater structure. Claire, if you want to unmute yourself and add something else. Okay, sorry for this. Um, so I will share my screen again. Ah, well, I continued uh, I, and, I, and I explained more or less the experiments. Yes, yes, of course, but I just have uh, so one last slide I would like to show, please. Okay. Um, okay, anyway, so you've, you... <laughs> okay, so can you see the screen? Yes. Um, so at the end, I would like to thank you, <laughs> and and so sorry for for the cutting power during the presentation. Uh, for us, it was a really great experience to be able to use your facilities and your robots, and it really helped us to gather some new data that we will use in our algorithm and to test them. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Thanks, Claire, for the presentation. And we move to the next one, which is from Institut de Ciències del Mar in Barcelona that asks for access uh, to the Ephraimer facilities. So, Pere Puig, if you can take over and present. Mm, hello, can you hear me? Yes, I think you are on the last slide or something. Oops, Oops sorry. Uh, can you already see the, the screen? Ah, uh, no, we are still in clear presentation. Yeah. Uh, okay, now you can try to share, Pedro. Okay, try to okay. do five minutes, please. Uh, cannot share because the other another one is share is sharing. No, no, no now we are seeing yours. It's fine. Oh, yeah, you seeing mine? Yeah, yeah we yeah. are seeing Ari Ariane on a ship. Okay. Do you yeah. see the the first slide now? Yes. 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 Okay. Let me see if I can I can drag this screen towards here so you can see my face instead of instead of my ear. Yeah. So this is a, a TNA action that um, was awarded to use the Ariane hybrid uh, ROV on a, on a cruise uh, to, the, to map the high resolution 3D terrain models in cold water coral habitats in Planets Canyon. So that was a project uh, requested by the Institute of Sciences del Mar in Barcelona, but with the support of University of Malta, the NEOs from Netherlands, NOC from UK and University of Sorrento from Italy and also Newark Canada from Canada. So, yeah, the cruise took place. Uh, the cruise was uh, funded by the BRIC project, the Spanish national project, and it was a 15 day cruise on board the research vessel Sarmiento de Gamboa. Took place the second fourth uh, of, uh, of February 2020, just uh, uh, we finished the, the cruise and in a week uh, it was the lockdown of the COVID pandemic. So we are very lucky to, to be able to, to conduct the cruise. And since the TNA action was awarded as for only seven days of, 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 of um, Ariane. So we divided the cruise in two legs. The first leg was uh, used, we used the 
the, the Ariane. And then we had also an, uh, another ROV on board, the Lidopus, uh, during the entire cruise. And the idea was for the first leg to dive with the Ariane to do the bathymetry and then follow the uh, same dives with the, the other ROV to, to take footage and, and samples of the, of the benthic, um, of the benthic uh, species, benthic communities. So before this cruise in the previous, in the previous project, we in, in, in 2017, we explored Blanes Canyon and we did seven ROV dives. And we noticed that at the canyon head uh, here in, 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 the, the, in the blue box, at the canyon head, there were really steep walls covered by, uh, by corals. We still see, see the first or? slide. Excuse me? We still see the first slide. You're still in this first slide? Okay, yeah, yeah. Let me we try see it. the whole PowerPoint with all the menus. Okay, okay. now okay. we now you see the first slide? Yeah, yeah, yeah. try it. Yeah, okay. Now, yeah. The, now the second? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. You can go. So that was that was the cruise. <laughs> That's the map. So and we did the we noticed that the canyon head had several sides with a very steep canyon walls uh, uh, um, with plenty of corals and then we went back in, as I said, in, in 2020 with the Ariane. So we installed the Ariane in the Sarmiento de Bamboa using the, uh, the frame that was used in the past for the Victor 6000. And we uh, installed the multi-beam echo center in a 40 degrees angle. So the idea was to uh, map the canyon walls, the really steep canyon walls starting from the axis and going up, up slope. So here you have a point cloud bathymetry survey from one of the canyon areas. And then we uh, did a much detailed survey flying at, the first one was flying at 40 meters of the, of the sea floor. And then we did some tests flying at 10 meters of the sea floor until you have the bathymetry of this, of this environment. This is a, a 20 centimeters grid resolution. So the three areas that I mentioned at the beginning were mapped uh, in two days of serving. So as I said, going from the canyon axis, going up, up slope, and then repositioning again, diving down and going that slope again. So here you have a 3D view of the upper canyon head bathymetry, quite impressive. This is a narrow gorge. So that's 200 meters. So the, 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 here that gorge is 50 meters um, uh, width. And this, the walls were really, really steep and, and, and in some cases overhanging. So and here you have the bathymetry already put in plane uh, process with the globe software from Ephraimer. And you, have, you can have here a nice, nice view of the, of the complex morphology that without this robotic tool couldn't be uh, mapped at all. Uh, you have the bathymetry and the reflectivity, the high reflectivity where there is rocky outcrops. Here they have the lower canyon head microbathymetry. We map uh, a really steep canyon wall, like more than 200 meters high with some terraces. And then in the back scatter, here you can notice that we could see the tracks of the trowel marks from the fishing activities going on in the canyon. And here you have the third, the third area that was mapped, the tributary canyon with a very flat uh, sea floor, a steep walls, 100 meters high, and again, a flat terraces on, 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 on each side. So the three areas were then, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, surveyed with the uh, inspection ROV Lidopus, so to map uh, the Venti communities and to take footage. And we'll combine the images from the one ROV with the bathymetry collected by the uh, Ariane. And if I have time, so I can show you a few videos of how the, the walls of the canyon look like. So those are, uh, this is a black coral, Leopatis glaberima. Probably this, this specimen perhaps has thousand years, uh, it's a thousand year old, it's quite large. And we could see direct impacts of bottom trawling, so nets entangled in the, in the rocks, pretty old nets because they are covered by, by mud. And the idea, the whole idea of the project was to study the indirect impacts of bottom trawling. So how the, the smoothing of the sediment was suspended by trawlers, how the sediment covers the colonies and they die by suffocation. So with these images, so I'm done.
So you have any questions, okay. just uh, post it in the chat and or yeah, uh, yeah we have another presentation and then we can have questions for all the presenters thanks a okay. lot for your presentation pero okay, thank you and we move to the next one which is also uh, from institute de ciencias del mar but this in this case they ask for the university of bremen installations and in this case akim i think will present uh, the experiments so akim if you want to take over Okay, now, can you hear me now? I was unable to unmute myself. Yes. Perfect. Thanks for the nice intro, which is already given, giving away what it, what it is all about. The most important thing is that I'm giving this presentation on behalf of Eulalia Garcia, who is not able uh, to attend today. So, so she's a marine geologist and tectonics person from, from ICM and was using the German vessel Meteor and some of our equipment, in particular the ROV Squid, a 2000 meter system seen on the right, and then also indirectly the Mebo seafloor robotic drill, which is seen in the center in an area in the Gulf of Cadiz in the Western Atlantic. And since she's a geologist, we will start with some geology background. What you're seeing here is the Mediterranean Sea. And, and the main purpose of the study is actually to look for earthquakes and their precursors along the plate boundary, which is coming in in the Straits of Gibraltar on the left in the map, and then in easing its way into a subduction zone in the Eastern Mediterranean. So if we focus in on the, on the Gibraltar area, what you are seeing is a bunch of fault systems which are coming from the Azores and go into the Mediterranean. Some of these faults are actively um, expulsing fluids. And what you are also seeing in particular in the central part is these are these little dots. These are all mud volcanoes which are also windows to depth. There's fluid and sometimes also solid material coming to the surface. So if you, if you study these systems, you are basically well, taking the pulse of the earth. You're looking at the, at the deeper seated processes by, by just well, taking surface samples or doing some experiments there. This is illustrated here. You can see the mud volcanoes in the center of the, of the picture. They are tapping into the sediments and, and some of the fault systems, they go even deeper. So they go all the way into the underthrust material down to the, to the Earth's crust. And, and the idea was basically to, to compare the two and see where the, the activity is highest. So the two robots we were using, is, it were the Mebo seafloor drilling systems, the Mebo 70 in our case, that's a robot on an umbilical. And what you are usually doing is you just take cores down to a couple of tens or even 200 meters depth. But if you're interested in monitoring something episodic like an earthquake or fluid seepage as Francesco presented, then you need to sacrifice some of your drill string, leave that in the hole so that the hole doesn't collapse. And then you can place observatories. You can see some examples here, some of them you can communicate acoustically with. Others are just self-contained autonomous systems and they have to be recovered by ROV. So there was a previous cruise between um, different institutions, including Barcelona and Bremen in 2018, where the drill was actually used in a couple of locations. And, and then there was the, the TNA call where we were offering some of our um, seagoing equipment and, and Barcelona submitted a proposal and they got some ship time and ROV time with, with the squid in order to try and recover the observatories, get a 3D map of the area, of the surrounding. This is particularly um, exciting for the, for the mud volcanoes because their boulders are coming up to the surface or you can see active venting and so on. So we were kept able to carry out six dives in total which recovered the three observatories which were set 
on the previous cruise. And then we were also able to do a couple of in-situ measurements like, like in-situ heat flow. We took a couple of sediment cores in order to study the material surrounding the observatories. This is a picture where this is shown. And then, then the Barcelona group did some, some geochemistry work on the poor waters in these sediments. You don't have to understand any of the details. The only important thing in this cross plot, which is looking at the salinity of the fluids, is that the mud volcanoes in yellow, they give waters which are more like tap water almost, a very low salinity. This is from, from diagenetic reactions in the clay-rich sediment, whereas the faults give you the opposite. They have a very saline, a brine-type um, composition, and this is pointing towards a crustal source, a much, much deeper source in these, in these fluids. Then the main part was obviously to look at the observatories. We found them all. We uh, were able to unscrew them all. You can see this is one of the um, self-contained ones. And we also did uh, some mapping in the area, microbathymetry and so on. And then we were able to see little pock marks and boulders which were coming to the surface and so on. The observatories look, look like that. They are pretty unspectacular. Uh, unspectacular. It's a pressure housing, basically. And at the bottom end, where you are looking into the deep and, and also sealed borehole, you have a pressure port, a thermistor, and then also this, this piece which is sticking out the, the furthest in um, electrical conductivity sensor so that we have some idea about the pressure in the hole, which is changing. If you have seismic activity or an earthquake, for instance, and then the temperature, which is changing with fluid flow, and then also the salinity, which is giving you some indication of the fluid source. And we were using, using the time series, or they are actually working on the time series as we speak. It's a very long record of over over two years, and you can see the pressure at the top. The scale does not really matter. It's fluctuating a bit. You have the tides in there too. You have storm events. This is the, the wave height is the blue um, graph underneath. And just as an example for the pressure response to an earthquake, here you can see that a data example at the lower right where you, where you have a foreshock to an earthquake, which is a little perturbation than the main earthquake, a little aftershock. And then you see that the ambient pressure in the hole is actually changing for good. So, so this is an indication that the stress field in the area has changed quite a bit. This is work in progress, so no, no final results. And, and, and the group in Barcelona sends their regards and, and acknowledges and thank you for the, for the support they got in, in EUMR. That's it. Okay. Thanks a lot for the presentation, Akim. And I give you the word to Fausto, so to start the discussion and the questions. Uh, thank you, Clem. Thank you to all the speakers. So we are a bit late, but we still have at least 15 minutes um, to discuss. Uh, the first thing I wanted to, to say is that uh, first we'll start with questions from the audience to the speakers that are still present, the TNA and user speakers. And then, time allowing, I would like also to ask the TNA and users to give us some feedback on some specific points that, that we had. So, uh, please, everyone that has a question, either raises your hand or write in the chat. I'll wait a bit of time to, to see the chat or... Uh, hands raised before we move to other questions and input. So uh, everyone should be here to answer the questions except the University of Auckland and uh, Chris from the Ulster University. Everyone else is here. No questions yet? Well, I can break the ice. Ah, okay. Uh, I see, okay. Akim needs to leave, but Ralph is here and Dr. Sue, you have to leave as well. Uh, I have a question, let me see. Ah, I have a question for Dan, Dan Hayes. Are you still here? I hope so. Yes, I see you. 
So uh, you mentioned that you couldn't, of course, go to NOC. They sent you the glider to Cyprus and you integrated everything there. How hard was to do the integration remotely with a vehicle that is not yours? Uh, and how how easy was to get support from NOC at the same time uh, far away? Hi, can you hear me? I, I need to yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, it was not too bad to do the integration because we had done that before. Uh, the problem really was when we sent the glider back to the NOC before the cruise to get everything tested again uh, for the pre-deployment check because we had a colleague from NOC on board was an engineer but we had to help him remotely and he had to spend 10 days in quarantine so we didn't have much time to uh, do all this pre deployment test so that was really challenging um, but when the glider left here it was fine so it's just um, it wasn't possible to, to do the final preparation and I don't know how else to do it except just allow for more time for this um, but uh, it was all very last minute, I guess I could say. Thank you. Other questions for other speakers? I'll again wait a bit before moving to other. Well, I had another question for a different speaker. Um, for uh, Claire from Toulon. Um, I saw the slide, but it was quickly about the diver recognition. How exactly are you doing this with which sensors and what can you tell us about your results? Although it, for me, it was still preliminary. It was just uh, the check board, right? Uh, are you talking about the gesture recognition system? Uh, yes, yeah, 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 exactly. With the divers, yeah. Uh, okay, so um, in this project, we want to use only the camera that are embedded on the robot. And for now, we are estimated the shape of the um, of the skeleton of somebody using the motion capture, and we are also recording the videos of this person, and we have some uh, specific uh, pattern that is seen both by the motion capture and the cameras, that will allow us to project the three D points um, track with the motion capture in the image. And then we, we aim at uh, reconstructing automatically the skeleton, then recognize the gesture uh, using some kind of, uh, I think we will use some deep learning techniques to, um, to classify the gesture on some data sets. So we, we are now using LSTM to recognize the gesture based on the, um, angle of the arm. Okay. Did you publish any, any paper already with these results? No. Uh, we have submitted one paper that will be published uh, in October in the French conf it's the French conference on, on biomechanics. And we will also publish, I think, in HRI. We will submit something in HRI in uh, October. Okay, okay. I'll, I'll follow up with you. Oh, I cry. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, other questions for the speakers? If not, we have some points to discuss that uh, Gerard Dooley from Limerick prepared. Uh, so if there's no specific questions, I'll ask Gerard to, to show these points. I think you can uh, go forward, uh, Gerard. Sure. Uh, good evening. Sorry, Gerard. Yeah. Yeah. So that I, I have a brief presentation around some of the marine data sets and the e infrastructure work package that, that so, you know, goes along with the TNA projects. So it's really around the marine data sets that are being uh, produced out of the TNA projects and how we handle that. You can hear me okay, yeah? Yeah. 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 So if I can share the screen there. You should be able, if not. Right there. Can 
You can see that, okay, yeah? Yeah. Oh, I figure that's the wrong way around. <gasps> okay, so you can see the, the main screen? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that, it's just a quick topic point just to get some topic that we can discuss around the TNAs that is a broad topic that goes across all the TNAs. Uh, so we've seen quite a broad introduction to the various activities ongoing within the EMR project under the TNA activities and topics. Many of these relate back to the topics which are being set out by European Commission under the Mission Board for Healthy Oceans and, and Coastal and Inland Waters that we, we discussed this morning. At uh, these topics, we'll see more infrastructure off our coastlines and a higher need to understand and monitor and inspect our environments, both from an infrastructure point in a commercial setting, but also from an environmental point. The requirement for more precise data is going to increase, and we've seen vast improvements to inspection data, from laser imagery data that you can see above to photogrammetry data sets. And these can be both for infrastructure that will go into our water columns or to, to try and understand the, the biohabitats that are either underwater in, in traditional settings or that are also on, on top of the, the marine infrastructures. However, this data and how it's going to be stored, uh, we should see a consistent uptake in this in, in e-infrastructure platforms across the, the various European projects and, and the various activities that we all have go on, going on within our institutes. So we have European marine data platforms, and many of you will be familiar and will be accessing and providing data sets to these platforms. But are there issues around access to all partners? And are the data formats and size requirements that we see for both laser imagery and large data sets from photogrammetry? Can we provide these up to these platforms? As we move to larger use and integration of AI and machine learning platforms, we will see the use and access to the data sets as a key important factor. Uh, we have many initiatives in this area in marine biohabitat segmentation such as the Big Picture Initiative, FathomNet Initiative from Ambari and others, such as the North Sea Treaty Initiative. And we've also seen the uptake of, of other sort of classifications across various uh, TNA projects that we have ongoing uh, within EUMR. The area of automated insight could make a significant contribution to the area of offshore wind and the marine biohabitat analysis and protection. So what, I guess, what I'm asking, what can we do as a community to make a collaborative effort in this area? So it's just a, a quick introduction and, and to see if as a community we can contribute to make, to make access to large data sets where we, can, where we can perform AI and machine learning algorithms, but also to provide it to other, other initiatives. And, I guess it's, it's just some area that I came up with there, so that, that might be of interest to the consortium. And it goes across many of the TNA projects that we saw today. Thank you, Jared. Um, I'd like first to ask the TNA end users maybe to say their words about what Jared just uh, asked. I think you are the best people that use the infrastructures and know maybe even better than the ones that were sharing them. What are the issues or what could be done better, let's say? I see some of them are here, Louisa, Claire, Dan, whoever wants to start first. I think if you cannot unmute, just let us know on the chat and I will unmute you. And also, and all the other partners from Marine Robots that are here, 
please, if you wish to contribute to the discussion, it's not just for the TNA end users or for Guilherme that already had to present so many people. Uh, I think Francesco should be here also, Chris. I don't know if it's a problem that they cannot unmute themselves, so I'm unmuting everyone. Well, if I if I start, maybe um, can you hear me, Fausto? Yeah, yeah, please, Rolf. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think one of the points is uh, the reprodu reproducibility of the data at the end of the day, and what data gets stored with it, the metadata. Um, you know, it's a big issue um, because it relates to calibration issues and all sorts of things. So you have to be very aware of what type of data you're storing. And, uh, and so all the other data that comes with it. So we have to have a protocol uh, for particular data sets, how to do that. I mean, there's a couple of initiatives. I know that uh, NOC is working um, with some British data center. Data center. Uh, we have a data center here. Gerard is working on these kind of things. But we have to come kind of to grips how we are going to do that in a kind of a more unified way. Thanks. I see Martin also raised his hand. Uh, Martin, please. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, it looks like. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I was just going to sit there and say it's, um, we've been working with the British Oceanographic Data Center um, to try and um, ensure that the data that we capture from the vehicles is fair. So that is the whole push is to make it all the data findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. Um, and it's when you dig into it, it's really quite complicated to actually how you enable it to do that. So you need all the metadata, but you also need a whole set of controlled vocabularies so that you can have um, a way of sort of accessing the data I, sort of ideally from machine to machine. Um, and so at BODC, so the British Ocean, uh, Oceanographic Data Centre, has this set of controlled vocabularies. And uh, as I sort of scratch away and try and understand it, 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 it is very complicated to work out how to manage this data. It isn't just a question of, you know, we just need to put it on a, a hard drive and expose it um, to actually to the community. So there is a, a large chunk of work to be done to actually make this data available and make it fair. And so we can feed it into the sort of global ocean observing system. And when people talk about digital twins, there's this sort of ambition to build that digital ocean, which was discussed earlier. And the only way you can do that is to make sure the data that you put in there is gonna be in a format, which is then accessible. Um, and I, I guess what I'm, what I'm saying is it's just, it's, uh, it's it's quite a lot of work to do it, and it's not trivial. <laughs> I can imagine. Uh, per uh, is also with the hand raised. Can you speak, Per? Yeah. yeah in, in our in our case, all the all the data that was collected as part of the TNA um, uh, with the Ariane was was stored in the Ephemer database in the Sisma. So they, they, they took care of, of, of all the data ingestion, ingestion and they just asked me for um, permits and, and, and restricted action or access or whatever. So I said that the, everything was, was, could, be, could be used for, for other users. And, and basically we follow the, the, ephemer, the ephemer standards that it's, it's pretty, pretty Pretty well developed, and and, and every all the data from their cruises uh, is stored there, and that's that's part of the of the of our cruise that that was linked to the TNA action access is 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 there. So if anyone can just um, play with the data, have a look at the data. So it's it's freely available to any any potential user. Thank you. Uh, Gerard, one thing I, I was thinking, uh, perhaps this data, it's even now more important given the fact that we have so many TNA remote assets, right? So in a pandemic situation or in a situation where maybe people are from far that they cannot travel, having access to the data and maybe doing pre-testing or just even 
testing with the collected data and not real experiments could help us even to have more assets and more people using our infrastructures. Do you agree? I, I guess through some of our TNA, you know, we we didn't have the the accessors on site either. So we were providing them through the through data platforms access to their their data sets basically that they need for their research. So it is more prevalent where you, you just need to provide the data set so over some secure platform. But it, it becomes, as you said, it becomes complex when, when you're looking at the standards and, and how you how you specify especially sensor data sets, you know, and how how you quantify each of the data sets and the calibrations and whatnot. When it comes to video data sets and you know, larger format data sets, a lot of the, just the, the raw format video and that, they, they're not getting stored from, from cruises or, you know, it's, it's hard to manage the, the, the size of the data sets that come off many of these TNAs. Definitely. You think there should be an effort at the European level or international to try to standardize how you do the metadata for optical cameras or sonars or mm. those type of sensors? I know traditionally, you know, bathymetry data would have been one of the main data sets that would have been looked at both in the US and Europe. So there is there is quite a concerted effort to to make bathymetry data sets online and there's there's various platforms for that. But there's there's no platforms really for, for video data sets or photo data sets or you know large larger formats such as point cloud data sets from lasers. So sure. I see one raised hand by Francesco Morelli. Uh, Francesco? Uh, hi, yes. Uh, one important aspect uh, when we discuss and talk about data sets uh, is the ground truth. Uh, and uh, especially when we are talking about underwater robots uh, in the 3D, there is no such a concept like what is the ground truth. Uh, and uh, that is uh, one of the huge issues, especially when we are talking about cross-domain collaboration. And when our, uh, the, our data sets uh, or, or papers are evaluated by other uh, roboticists uh, who are used to have a very precise ground truth, for example, with uh, DGPS. So maybe there needs to be also something that's uh, considered the fact that the concept of ground truth underwater is something different. Uh, and uh, but still, we need to find a way to evaluate because even if we, sometimes we don't have the ground truth, so how can we evaluate uh, the, the goodness of a certain algorithm with respect to another one? Hmm. That's a very good question. I don't know if anyone has a solution or has an answer for, to that. If so, please say now. Uh, we'll have well, one minute left. We, we got five minutes extra from the organizers, but we really need to close. But if Really, someone has a comment to this uh, very big question from Francesco. I, I invite you to answer. No. Well, ah, sorry, uh, Claire cannot unmute. Uh, I'll unmute you, Claire, just a second. Uh... Uh, okay. um, we are trying to, to address this problem of data sets uh, with using this, uh, so this motion capture system. We are trying to gather many data because we are also interested in underwater slam. Mm. And we are also working with Ifromer on, uh, on trying to make some ground truth using uh, optical based SFM or things like this. And I think it would be a good good thing to be able to to have some media to to share this uh, this new data set. And so for small spaces, we can use this kind of motion tracking systems to have the ground truth. But then for huge space, I think some kind of I don't know data fusion of e ENS and USBL can be good good idea in underwater. So for, for us also, this is, uh, this is something we would like to see in a, in a close future. And I, think, I, I guess when, when you talk about data sets like that, there's, there's not much access to, to data sets like photogrammetry data sets from ROVs or similar platforms. You know, and, and it's, it's hard for researchers then to, to be able to do the research because first thing they have to acquire is, is large chunks of data sets. And then look at then look at the research part, which is the sensor fusion or the you know the structure for motion to give you the, the navigation data to match it to the, the laser or whatever you're doing. So but 
you know, the data sets exist. They're just not, they're just not really available. Hmm. You know, we, we have plenty of data sets that there's some up on the UMR platform. So, so there hmm. are some uh, data sets about, but the, they're not being shared a whole lot because they're, they're new types of data. They're, they're new research areas. So. Yeah. Exactly. So I see there was one left, one more hand. It's Pere from Girona, and as Girona was responsible for the TNAs, I'll give him the word and ask him to close the Marine Robot session as a project partner. Pere, please. Okay, just just first few words on the on the comment on the data sets and the comment on the ground truth. First, of course, the use of data sets it's it's important, not only for comparing algorithms, but also to share data, which is really very expensive and very difficult to to get. The, the truth is that doing a good data set, in my opinion, it's hard. It re requires a lot of work. So what we need, I think, is a way to find uh, how to reward the people who do that, who, do that, who does this. I think there are some, some journals like the International Journal on Robotic Research, which is actually doing this. So you can get a very good paper out of just a data set that you have done and you make it available for the community. And I think this is one of the ways to go because it's really, really expensive in terms of manpower to do these, these data sets. So we need to find a way to, to reward the people who, who does this. That's one thing. The second thing is that getting the ground truth really underwater is hard. For a small areas, like Claire was commenting, I think we can have few things that we can do. And certainly the system, the motion capture system they were testing in Girona, it's one good candidate. The big problem happens when we move from out of the swimming pool and we go into open areas. And there, there um, I don't think there's too much things we can do. It's difficult. I think what we need to do is in some conference, in some place to do a workshop in this thing and try to discuss what are the, the methods we think uh, are better to do this. But I don't think it's something we can answer uh, quick. I mean, first, when we do SLAM, there are things that we used to do, which is to, to try to check the consistency of the data, which is not a ground truth, but if your data, when you, when you map an area several times, is consistent all the time, it means uh, probably your data is good. It does not mean really that the georeferencing of the system is good, but at least it's consistent. So there are, there are things that can be done. But to be honest, I think that this is something which is hard. And in some conference, it would be nice to have a, a, some session where we could be more than presenting papers, discussing about how we should face this, this problem and, and the problem of, of sharing the data. There are actually a few data sets. We, we did in the past few of them that we made them available and they will be used by a lot of people. So I think really is, is something that we should consider to do because it's, it's, a, it's also a contribution to the research, not, not only the algorithms. The data itself, it's, I think, is a good contribution. And just uh, to finalize the session, as Fausto suggests me to do, to close the session, uh, I just uh, want to thank all, all the, the authors for presenting and, and also, of course, Fausto and Guillem, which make a great work putting all this session together. Uh, I think it has been a, a session that has shown the potential of this infrastructure project where a lot of infrastructure which are available all, along Europe uh, are probably for, for the first time made available for third parties, which again, I think is the way to go because having all these uh, infrastructures in the labs is expensive and it's um, really difficult to reach the point where you have uh, the systems really and working. So, so having a, a, the mint at, uh, by using an European project to, to share this um, infrastructure, I think really it's, it's also very, very interesting. So thank you, everyone. And, and I don't know, Guillem, you, you've been driving the session. You should, you should finally close it, I think. No, no, I think you did a very good closing. And actually, it's Fausto managing everything. <laughs> so I think we should give the time for the next people, because everyone is waiting for the people later today. Yeah, I am. So.
Okay. So we can finish See it here. Later. The organizers will be happy that we finish. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thanks I think Ricardo Alessandro will Thank say you something. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all for participating. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot to all the participants, to all the you Marie Robots partners, and thank you, Pere. Nice to see you. And thanks a lot to the shirts. So thanks, uh, Joao, Fausto, and uh, Ian. We are uh, more or less in time, so I'm very happy also about this. And now we are going to move on and we will have the, um, another session about uh, EU funded projects uh, plus the first uh, uh, industrial uh, speech. So now we are going to have three uh, European projects and then the industrial uh, speech. And uh, I would like to leave the floor to Dino. So the, the next chair is uh, Edin. Hello, everyone.